Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be dialing into this session, whether you're with us live or whether you're watching us on replay. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being interested in this topic. Uh, the three of us certainly are, and we'll have a great conversation around it. Um, and I just want to make sure that we are, yeah, we should be live and you, we, you should be able to see us. So once again, welcome. It is a fairly uh, bold topic we're going to be covering today, and I'm in, excited that I have two such highly influential people with me here today to um, help me do a bit of a deep dive into it. Um, and before we do, I just want to remind everyone that the chat is open and it will be open throughout the session. It will be monitored throughout the session. So feel free to drop us a hi, let us know where you're dialing in from, uh, share any thoughts, any questions, any reflections. I will be pulling them up um, during the session. And as you can see, we've got amazing guests. Um, so I'm sure they'll be happy to answer any questions that we can manage during this session. But when it comes to the topic itself, um, in the diversity, equity, and inclusion context, we use the term DI business case a lot. However, it's important to understand what does that really mean? What do we mean by that? And what is the data that we actually use to sell? to sell our DEI products and services? And is this data actually representative of the promised, quote unquote, promised DEI benefit? And so we have had several of such uh, reports and studies that have gone viral over the years. We've had several McKinsey reports. We have BCG, Deloitte, and other large consulting firms who have released a number of these viral reports that claim grand business benefits from engaging in DEI activities, especially uh, diversifying the leadership ranks. Um, however, also in 2020, we had another uh, viral not report but an article by Robert, uh, Robin Eli and David Thomas, who uh, I quote said, leaders might mean well when they tout the economic payoffs of hiring more women or people of color, but there is no research support for the notion that diversifying the workforce automatically improves a company performance. And so these two things might seem slightly controversial, and they certainly are, and that is exactly the reason why we're going to be going into them. And I'm very uh, pleased to be on the stage and share the stage with two, like I said, highly influential people, um, Chab Toth and Dr. Ash, uh, Jonathan Asher Langty. Langty. And, before, and I'm probably going to take a bit of a breath here to allow both of you to make um, short introductions because I don't think any of you uh, or either of you need an introduction to be honest uh, but once again as the as the gentlemen do that uh, I'll remind that the chat is open so drop us um, a hi. Um, Chava would you like to kick us off here? So my name is Chava <clears throat> and originally I'm from Hungary and I live in the UK I spent half of my life there and half here so far it's half and I'm the guy who always talks about the power of uncommon mindset and the three invisible forces that make or break a team. Because often we cannot see the root cause of the problem, but we can just experience the symptom. And it doesn't really matter how much we reflect on something we don't know about. So we have to give people the vocabulary. And we also have to measure things so we can visualize them and we can optimize them. This is a topic where guessing is not really an option, even though a lot of people do that but it doesn't deliver the results that they are hoping for. And that's why I think that our job and our responsibility is to make this topic as uncomplicated and practical as possible so people can actually use it. Because it's almost like you can put all the ingredients in your mouth and you can expect it to taste like a pizza, but it's not going to happen. You can have the ingredients. Diversity is the potential for success or disaster, depending on how much you understand yourself and others. And that is something that at least most people need to learn. I had to. It's not automatic. So I think this is where it goes wrong sometimes. Like you said, that people read a lot about the business case, that diversity is good for the business. Not necessarily. You have to make it work. Thank you, Chab. And, uh, and I love that you talked about, you know, how to make something elusive, um, actionable. 
uh, and also the fact that you know uh, we read a lot about it, but how to actually make it again, you know, actionable and applicable is you know what we're going to be talking about here. Thank you for that, Dr. Jonathan. Well, first off, thank you for inviting me here, Baiba. It's great to be here with you, be here with Chaba. So I'm Dr. Jonathan Ashong Lamti. Everyone calls me Dr. Jonathan. I'm the founder of the Element of Inclusion, and we work with organisations to make them inclusive. I've got a PhD from the London School of Economics. I talk about it a lot, and this informs a lot of my work. It gives me the academic rigor that our clients love. I'm also the host of The Element of Inclusion, which is a podcast. Every week we inform and educate using applied research, thought leadership. One of the things I do a lot, and I'm kind of known for, is saying unpopular things about the diversity and inclusion space, of which the business case, the so-called business case, for diversity, the propaganda problem of diversity, the proxy problem, the rhetoric problem. I talk a lot about some of these things and maybe we'll come on to that today, but um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you both. And I just want to say hi to a few of the people who've joined us. We've got Sandra from Saudi Arabia. Uh, happy Ramadan, Sandra, if you're engaged in that. We've got Rita, we've got Ajwa from the UK, Rikta from India, and a few other um, LinkedIn users as well. Uh, a couple of people are saying that uh, the stream is a little bit slow and keeps freezing. I hope you can um, hear us okay, uh, and please keep those comments coming just in case there are any issues. Um, but I am very excited to uh, dive into the topic. And before we do so, Adita, let's let's start at a surface level. And what I'm very curious about is when you do hear this notion, business case, you know, when you when you hear your a company or uh, a potential client of yours talking about the DEI business case, what are your first reactions? What are the first thoughts that go through your mind? So I'm very curious about that. <laughs> Shabba, go on. <laughs> to me, um, I think sometimes it's a buzzword. And we use a lot of big words without understanding what it means exactly. And I think sometimes diversity can turn into a PR and marketing tool instead of a strategic HR tool. And I think we are going to talk about this a bit later on. Because just because a company needs something, it doesn't mean that they want it. And I think this is the challenge from our perspective. And this is what I learned from one of our clients and they specialize in energy transition. And he said that whatever you do, energy transition, for example, in this case, has to be investable. And maybe it sounds nasty, but technically investable means that the companies realize it's practical, it's profitable, so they want to do it. And that is the biggest challenge. And this is exactly what we are working on, to make it practical, to, to make it more visible. When you talk about mindset, inclusion, diversity, it sounds really fluffy, let's be honest. And if you cannot hold something in your hand, if you don't see it in front of you, for most people, it's not real. It's nice, it's good to tick the boxes, but it's not practical, that's not my priority. So we have to find the language that they speak and we have to build on what they already know. And that is the language of money, growth. And that's exactly why I'm moving away from talking about diversity and inclusion, even though the topic is exactly the same, but we talk about growth. Because if you're a business owner, you're growing or you're declining as a business. There is no plateau. That's a myth. And it's not political. It cannot be hijacked. Growth is good if it's intentional. And yes, that is part of it because it's all about the people. And that's something that we can and we should learn. But first, we have to find that language. It's almost like when you tell people that eating sugar is bad for you, don't need that. And they say, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. But if you go to the doctor and they tell you that you have diabetes, then you take it seriously. And this is where the measurement is important. Talking about is nice, but people don't do anything until it hurts enough. And we have to create this awareness. They have to understand that, yes, you can get used to the pain and the confusion and the frustration as well. It doesn't mean that it's supposed to be like that. So once we measure something, the three invisible forces, psychological safety, motivational drivers, and cognitive diversity, then you make it as real and tangible as possible so we can deal with it. 
And I think that's that's a really important thing to do. Thank you, Chaba. What are your first reactions, Dr. Jonathan? Well, I'm, I've got a massively biased uh, reaction simply because of my training. So I am a chartered accountant, right? So I'm a member of, the, I'm a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. I used to be an auditor. So I spent years just going to companies, literally doing their accounts, doing their audits. So when it comes to finance and business, I was the person who you would talk to. I can cut your budget. So in terms of the business case, it's worth remembering that corporate organizations in the West for the past, well, for most of the 20th century, the primary purpose of an organization, a profit-making organization is to make money, right? And therefore, the, and this is that whole Milton Friedman approach, which is the purpose of an organization specifically is to provide returns to the shareholders. These are profits, right? So when you talk about the business case or just that phrase business case, the assumption is anything that you do in an organization has to make money. And as I said, as an accountant, I was literally there. I'd go through all of your costs. What's that for? What's that for? And all it needs to do, you're either going to reduce costs or increase profits, make money. Okay. So now this is the approach in in organizations, contemporary organizations. And when people talk about diversity, there's it's a loaded term. So when you say business case for diversity, what we're really saying is we want to create a change. Okay, we want to do something different. And so we fall back on this idea of, okay, anything that we do needs a business case. So what is the business case for diversity? And so that's the backdrop that all of these organizations and all of these conversations are coming from, it's the idea that, okay, we need a business case to do something. Tell me how that works. Something else you said, Biber, at the very beginning, you talked about how we, you said how we sell DEI products and services. That's crucial because if you are, and this is why I think the business case for diversity has been manipulated a little bit. It's in the interests of diversity consultants to have a business case for diversity. Because if we're saying diversity leads to greater profits, greater this, greater that, growth, as Chaba was saying, it's now financially relevant and important when you speak to someone like me, who's an accountant, to create this, to actually improve this. And so this is the challenge. And so I think that's the backdrop for the whole conversation around the business case for diversity but it gets manipulated a lot. Thank you both. Yeah, and a very, very interesting and, um, and insightful views. Um, and I like how you broke, broke it down, uh, Dr. Jonathan, around you know, where the, the term business case initially and historically comes from and how it's been sort of um, floated into the DEI and why potentially, you know, uh, it, it has become a loaded term that not necessarily um, everyone agrees with in terms of how it's been used today. Because, you know, what a lot of people are saying is that, you know, the house is burning. You can see the house is burning. And what you want me to do is still provide you with proof that the house is burning. I, you know, AKA the business case. And so a lot of people that, um, feel that the DI the business case, uh, that there is this, you know, audacity and ridiculousness around it when people need to be convinced of the obvious, you know, convince me why do we need to hire more women or people of color? Um, you know, we already serve diverse communities, but, but and we don't need convincing to sell to those communities our products or services, but we need convincing why do we need to hire them? And so I'm interested in what do you feel is the value of a DEI business case, if any, and how reliable is a DEI business case as we know it today? Can I jump in quickly on this? Please. So, so there's a couple, there's a couple of points that you've raised. Number one, the business case needs to exist for DEI consultants to try and sell their services. So they want, they will perpetuate this idea of the business case to speak to people. Number one, right? So you, you need to be, okay. It's in your interest for there to be a business case. So you have to be careful when people are selling you that. 
Secondly, it's an attempt to speak to organizations in a language that they're going to respond to, right? Because when we talk about, in very crude terms, and actually you talked about Eli and Thomas, they talk about this idea of a social justice argument as well, right? So it's just the right thing to do. 2020, everyone was talking about race. They were talking about how they were against systemic racism and they kept on saying it's the right thing to do. That doesn't improve your profits. No one really cares about that prior to 2020. That was a real turning point. Before it was all about the business case. The narrative has changed, but the business case was an attempt to really engage people who otherwise didn't care about this. And also you have to remember a lot of the people who we're talking about, who were born in the 20th century and have got that 20th century approach to leadership, they don't think there's anything wrong. They think that the workplace is fair. So when you're introducing all of these new things, introducing lots of jargon, it doesn't make sense. I work in this space. I see a lot of what people say out there and it doesn't make sense. So it's even more confusing if you're not even motivated to create that change. I absolutely agree with you. And I like that you um, talk about, you know, the business case from both sides, you know, the business case that is needed within the organization um, and also how the business case gets perpetuate, not only perpetuated, but also validated uh, when it's being used by DEI practitioners. So thank you for that. And uh, Chaba, what are your views on What's the value of a DEI business case, if any, and, and how reliable do you feel it is as we use it today? I think if you look at the big data for long enough, it can confess anything that you want. That's the problem with that. Because when, when, when the companies ask for a business case, technically they are asking for proof. Tell me that being nice to people and trying to understand them and trying to value them makes sense. I can make money on it. Technically, this is what they're asking for because it's an invisible topic. And for example, if you read that uh, research from McKinsey that ethnically diverse companies are 35% more efficient or productive than homogeneous ones. I, I know there are a lot of people who jumped on it immediately that, oh, there you go, it's a proof. So now we know the solution. We need even more ethnicities because we can make more money. I think if you stay on the superficial layer, yes, it makes sense. But if you look at the actual research, for example, the one from Google, that the number one trait of high-performing teams is psychological safety, then it's pretty safe to assume that those companies are much more psychologically safe and inclusive. That's why they perform better than anyone else. And that is why they attract more diversity, not the other way around. If you try to increase diversity without inclusion, it's going to turn into painful liability. It's not automatic. Every time we get a request from clients, I always say that, don't aim for diversity, aim for inclusion. If you get that right, diversity is going to increase as well. But it doesn't really work the other way around. That's the problem with that. And especially where we have, where, you know, both of you already have touched on it, where, you know, organizations have their hardcore business goals and metrics associated to profitability and performance, to innovation, um, to employee retention, recruitment, uh, engagement. Those are hardcore metrics. Those are metrics that can be binary, ultimately, you know, they're either there or they're not there. So they are measurable. And when we talk about, um, you know, inclusion, equity, justice, um, those things are often elusive. Um, and, you know, as you both have already mentioned, they are not something tangible that you can hold in hand. Whereas you can hand, you know, you can hold a report of, is specific numbers of how many of, of each, you know, intersection or, or social um, identity of people you have in your organizations. And so, and so again, you know, with this business case, um, I think where, where people get tangled, where organizations get tangled quite a bit is between this sort of cause and effect and what's cause and effect and what's a correlation. Um, and so organizations often use these um, reports um, as a bulletproof evidence that the D, that the diversity leads to that profitability, to performance, innovation, employee engagement, and those kinds of things. And so this business case rhetoric, I feel, has resulted in, uh, for one of the better words, an epidemic of misinformed leaders. 
and not only misinformed leaders, but also misinformed DEI practitioners who, are, you know, we already spoke about who not only perpetuate, but also validate what they don't understand fully. And, uh, and so we end up with these misinformed leaders and also DEI strategies that ultimately don't work because they are based, as Chabi mentioned, on the, on the diversity rather than things that actually unpin diversity because diversity is a potential, as you already said. It's not something that automatically grants inclusion and equity and therefore automatically grants the growth, the profitability and so on. And so if the business case um, isn't the solution or, or if it isn't about the business case, what do you feel is a better solution and, and, and a better way to engage in this conversation and potentially replace this notion of business case if we can? Can, can I just revisit the point about the business case itself? Because I think Please. just for some clarity, so, and you, we're talking about the McKinsey reports, right? And so the McKinsey report did say that where you've got ethnic, I'm talking about the first one in particular, where you've got ethnic diversity, um, where you've got gender diversity in senior leadership roles, it led to whether it was profits or performance or returns, everything else, right? Now, you, you brought up the point about causation and correlation, because if you actually look at what that report says, which no one does, but if you actually look at the report, it says that there is a correlation. So one is related to the other, but they don't know which one causes which. That's crucial. That is crucial information to know. And in most of this research, they will say there is a relationship but we don't know if all of these amazingly profitable companies became diverse because they're profitable or they had the diversity and then they became profitable. We don't know which is which. I labor that point because it's really important. Most people are leading you and the report itself, all of them lead you to believe that the diversity causes um, the profits. So number one, we don't know if that's true, okay? You also hear other people, you go to panel events and people are standing there pulling out all this research that says the same thing. But if you look at the body of research, the body of research, which is in, when you talk about that HBR article, professors Eli and Thomas, that's what they said when they said, actually, there's no proof. There's no actual proof because the body of research doesn't support the business case for diversity in the way that you've been led to believe. So this goes back to the previous point about reliability, a claim that the business case of diversity is reliable or established is not true. Okay. That's the crucial first point. The second point is, as you said, how do you actually deal with it? It's worth drawing a distinction between what diversity is and what inclusion is as well. So when we think of diversity, we think of it as a, a, a management approach that means that as individuals, we recognize that we have differences and there is values in those differences. So that's a value judgment, right? And that's not the same as equality. We're saying that we have differences and it's a good thing. And so we're going to look for that. And we can, we can get into what type, surface level, deep level diversity, inclusion, systematic business strategy to ensure that everyone shares the same advantages and benefits, what we always say, Everyone can perform, everyone can belong, everyone can reach their potential. So if I agree with what Chabu was saying, if we focus, the aim is to build this inclusive organization, but it implies a meritocracy. And you've heard people say this as well. The diversity doesn't matter. It depends, it depends on your organization and your very specific circumstances. So how do you address this? You need to really focus on what diversity and inclusion mean in your organization, not this generic idea. One of the three biggest problems, we always talk about this, that organizations experience on their inclusion journey is about performance, the business case, which is specifically, why is it good in your organization? Instead of relying on everyone else saying, oh, it's great, here's research, ask yourself, why is it good in your specific organization? And you should be spending nearly all of your time answering that question. Thank you for that. And there are a couple of comments I'll bring up uh, in a moment as well. Uh, and someone is saying that uh, 
<laughs> you know, for your opinion, Dr. Jonathan, that they love unpopular things. So your opinion <laughs> <laughs> is well valued here. Thank you for that. Um, Chabo, what are your things and how would you build um, upon what Dr. Jonathan has just said? Well, I fully agree that there's a lot of confusion about diversity and inclusion. And to be honest, that's the reason why we focus on cognitive diversity, the way people think and process information. And that is the only layer that has proven benefit in terms of performance. And that's important because we have plenty of case studies to show you that often there is a team where you have a lot of different looking people who think the same way. And of course they get along. Of course they get along with each other. That's the point. But what happens when two people disagree? What happens after that? To me, that's the dividing line between diversity and inclusion. That's the difficult part. That's exactly where the potential lies for success or disaster. Most people don't want to be right or they want to be right. They don't want to get things right. And there's a big problem there. And that's exactly the definition of uncommon mindset that you are able to see the same situation from different perspectives so you can make better decisions. And then you can choose to respond instead of just reacting. But that is something that we need to learn because you see the world from your own perspective. It kept you alive. Why would you doubt it? But we have to understand that just because we disagree, it doesn't mean that somebody is wrong. So if you learn how to ask the right questions, so for example, what do you see that I cannot? What do you know that I don't? Then we can turn diversity into inclusion instead of painful liability. So we specialize in measuring psychological safety, motivational drivers, and cognitive diversity, because if you score high on these dimensions, that's where the magic happens. That's where growth happens under the right amount of friction. And if you are psychologically safe as a company, then you are also inclusive. You couldn't feel psychologically safe if you were not included. So that's, that's a pretty good sign that yes, we can improve it. And once the clients understand what those numbers mean, they can also see how much they improve because this is also a diagnostic tool. So we can do it every three or four months. So you can see that whatever you're doing is working or not. And the reason why it's important because if you look at the employee engagement scores for the last 20 years in the US, they haven't really improved. It's pretty much the same. Companies spend billions and billions on the same solutions expecting different results, which is pretty much the definition of insanity. And that's not the idea because they never zoom out a little bit to see if it's working or not. Often the evaluation is based on how entertaining somebody was. You don't know if it was valuable till three, four, six months later, but you get the evaluation. Yeah, that trainer was great. That coach was great. They made me feel comfortable. Don't feel comfortable, feel safe. There's a big difference between psychological safety and physical comfort. And if these distinctions are not clear, then people have the wrong expectation. And I think once we give people the vocabulary, a frame of reference, then it's much easier to talk about these sensitive topics like personal and cultural differences, because pretty much they are the same. Can I, can I build on a couple of points that you said there, Chaba? I like the point you said around neurodiversity, I, th I think it's an important one. I, I think it's also worth mentioning that it depends on the type of work that we're doing, right? Specifically, because I think what you've said lends itself to creative service-based organizations, right? But in truth, what we find is neurodiversity, it, it, and I suppose it depends on what you mean by neurodiversity specifically as well. But if we're talking about diversity in the way that people think or approach problems, there are circumstances where we don't want diversity, yeah. right? If we're talking yeah. about an emergency situation and we're part of a highly tuned team and we've been doing drills for a particular, you know, we're doing an operation, right? We, we're in an ambulance. Actually, we follow procedures. If I'm a police officer and, and I'm entering a building and it's um, you know, it, a sort of violent situation, there are procedures that we follow that actually we don't want people to move or, or vary. So I, th I think it's always, always worth highlighting that the context really, really matters. I think that's, re that's really important to bring up because um, this is why I say, what does it look like in your specific organization? 
Yeah, I agree with you definitely because everybody can turn a really good idea into a really bad one if they overdo it. So as soon as you can measure something, people think that we have to aim for hundred percent. Said no, 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 come down. No, <laughs> we have to find the balance. Don't overdo it because it turns into a disadvantage. So I do agree with that. And the site, do you know what the thing about psychological safety as well that you bring up? Because you talked about employee engagement surveys. A lot of those surveys. You know, a lot of them aren't fit for purpose anyway. As sometimes they're not actually measuring the things they claim to measure. And if we look at who engages with these employee engagement surveys, often if you think of people who are disadvantaged, marginalized, underrepresented, they're not engaged with the organization. Sometimes they're even missing, depending on how that data is calculated and analyzed and interpreted. So I, I think... I think it's really important to reconsider how we collect data, how we engage with people to make sure that actually the psychological safety that we're talking about is there because some people don't even feel comfortable responding to these questions. Yeah. I work with people, even, even myself, when I get a survey asking me information, unless I know and trust you, I'm not going to, I, I'm, I probably will choose not to engage. But at the same time, as a researcher, I always want to help other people who are collecting data, right? And I think it's a fair point. That's why, for example, our survey is anonymous. So there's no name. Nobody can check what you said because otherwise it would defeat the point. But what you said about the employee engagement surveys, I fully agree with that. And also, I think it's often one-sided. They're asking people if they feel engaged, but they don't ask them if they try their best to feel engaged, to reach out to other people, to find motivation, to find purpose. It's just asking them, you feeling okay? Is everything fine? But there's no active participation. And I would love to ask questions about that because you have to unhide yourself. A company can be really inclusive. So for example, when we do the psychological safety one, then we can break it down into different subcategories. And one of those is inclusion. So a company can be really inclusive, but if you don't unhide yourself, you don't step up when you can, nobody can help you. So for example, when we measure this within a team and we can see that that score is low, then instead of shaming the company into inclusion, that bad, bad company, we have to boycott you. No, let's find out what the real problem is, why people feel like that. So it's not about hunting them down, but it's about finding out what happened, what is the root cause so we can address it. Because maybe somebody just had a baggage from the previous job, or maybe there was a misunderstanding. Maybe something else is going on in their personal life, or maybe it's true. They have a bad leader, but let's deal with facts instead of shaming people, accusing or applying toxic positivity. Let's focus on accurate thinking and then we can make progress. So I would rather promise less and deliver more. And sometimes it makes it more difficult to cut through the noise, but I'm not really willing to do what Baiba explained in the beginning that let's promise everything. Diversity is the solution for everything. That's the silver bullet that you need. No. There's more to it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you both. And I dropped off for a moment, but I think I have um, captured, you know, most of what you're saying. And I've got a couple of um, thoughts on that, but I just want to pull up um, a question or a couple that we've got in the comments. And um, Anna is saying, would you say that business case a synonymous, is a synonymous for the benefit? And how do we know it today? Are we talking specifically about diversity? Is so? Are we saying something like business case for diversity, benefit of diversity? Yeah, I think we're going to keep it within the DNI framework. Yeah. Yeah. Then I would say yes. It is. It is an attempt to make it synonymous because the benefit, but that benefit, that benefit has to be something that the person who you're speaking to values. This is why, can you see how this starts to commoditize it? Really what we're, we're talking about here is the commoditization of individuals, identity and aspects of your social identity. So you are saying, yeah, what is the benefit of having more person X, category Y, tick box this? Yeah, yeah I agree in that context. Mm. And I think, go on Chaba. No, I think it's, it's benefit, yes, but also slash evidence because people just need this illusion of certainty. 
that I'm investing my money into something. And uh, for example, when I do the webinar every single month, and then I show people the employee engagement trends for the last 20 years in the US, they're surprised that the numbers are not improving, but they are worried about investing in something new. So you know what you mentioned in the beginning that your house is on fire. I think it's slightly different. It's almost like having termites in your house, which means that you don't see the symptoms for long, but when you see them, it might be too late. And to me, the cultural differences are almost like a corporate diabetes, the silent killer. You think that everything is fine and then suddenly it goes downhill. And that's why it's important to find out what's happening so we can address the issues because people are great. They can get used to something good and bad as well. So you need more punishment and you need more reward as well, but we get used to it. So let's get more intentional about it. And I know that people need illusion, illusion of certainty, even though certainty doesn't exist in nature. Few things are, yes, certain, and often the timing is unpleasantly a surprise, but we have to speak their language. We have to introduce this topic in a way that they understand it and also they want it. And we can do that if we build this awareness around the topic, not by promising more than we can deliver, but by delivering facts and making it practical. Thank you. And there is another question that I want to pull up uh, that I think is quite an interesting one. Is Ram is asking, do you feel that there are any risks looking at DEI through a business slash profit lens as opposed to that right thing to do argument? Any traps not to fall into while doing it? And I love this question. Chapa, so I've been jumping in quite quickly. I've, I've... I've got I've got a few thoughts, but Chaba. I think there's always a risk, and also it's a really subjective topic. What do we mean by right thing? Because when you look at the DNI field, then I think it can be easily hijacked, and it, it can be politicized quite quickly. And everybody has an agenda, something they are passionate about, and they just focus on that tiny section instead of the whole. So when I talk about this topic, then to me it's more about the quality of interaction among people is the quality of the culture within a company, the quality of relationship with ourselves and others. We can create inclusion only if we understand ourselves and others. And that's something that we need to learn. The problem is that most people don't know that. They use their mindset like my granny uses her smartphone. She can use a few apps really well, but she doesn't know it's a supercomputer. If it breaks down, she doesn't know how to fix it and she doesn't know how to upgrade it. 95% of our actions are driven by values and beliefs we are not even aware of, but we think that we are so objective and logical. And we also need to understand that the brain is not designed for diversity because diversity means unpredictability. And that is the last thing our primal brain wants. And we have plenty of case studies to show that as well, that when diversity goes up, psychological safety goes down in the beginning, because that just means that you have people who behave and think and react differently to what you expect. And that's why we have to learn about these things so they become more predictable and our brain loves it. Then we can include them, but not until then. And when we talk about inclusion, it's important to mention self-inclusion because that's the real pandemic, the lack of it. People with low self-esteem, they have to surround themselves with people who agree with them, who think like them. So they just create this illusion around them that yeah, everybody thinks like us. And if they don't, they are against us. That's wrong. And even the social media algorithms are designed that way. That they get rid of everything that you disagree with and they just amplify this cognitive bubble around us. And that's dangerous. So yes, we can overdo things, definitely. And that's why we have to practice cognitive flexibility, which is the difficult part. Do you talk to people you disagree with? Do you talk to people who think and behave differently? Do you want to learn from them or you want to convince them? Thinking is difficult. It's physically tiring. <laughs> That's why most people don't do that. Thank you for this. I want to come back to, sorry. No, 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 you go for it. I was going to say, I, I definitely want to come back to a couple of points that were raised about self-inclusion as well. But um, to answer Rama, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. To answer your question uh, about do you feel that there's any risks looking through 
the business profit lens. For, so when you say the right thing, I'm thinking of social justice versus profit. So I, I would say yes. I would say there's no, several risks, including things like um, tokenization, where your identity is valuable, but your ability is not. So they're focusing on what you look like or what category you belong to, as opposed to your actual, you know, your, your capabilities and your competencies. That is a risk because we start to focus on that. That leads to problems for individuals and organizations. Um, the commoditization of people in that regard. So, oh, you look a particular way. Can we put you on, on the front of the, of the website here? So very closely linked to tokenization, but depending on what we're talking about at any given time, we're going to decide who's important for that context. So if it's International Women's Day, maybe we're, you are more valuable, you're commoditized. And also there's labor involved with that as an individual. You now need to perform. And this, this brings us on to performance management and everything else as an individual, right? How you perform and manage your identity in the workplace. So there's, there's definitely a risk there. So there's a couple of risks for the individuals as well that I think are harmful to individuals. Um, any traps to fall into? I think it's related to that. I think the playbook for most organizations is to, fall, is to follow this and they fall into the traps. I say all the time, people know me, panel events. I find that most panel events for organizations, they normally get people who aren't experts or don't have that deep knowledge and they don't actually do anything to accelerate the, the organization in the direction that they're going. So they're very performative. You've probably heard this phrase a lot as well. They are performative. So they're performing a role on a stage for a particular audience without actually focusing on doing the actual work. We talk about you know the seven common mistakes that organizations make. It often buys into this, buying into a generic business case, focusing on your reputation, focusing on leaders, doing one at a time. So there's, there's this is whole thing that we've got, but specifically related to this, yeah, there are several risks mm -hmm. with um, focusing on a business case for diversity. Thank you for those. And I think, and, and you know, you both um, covered it very eloquently um, because I think, you know, one of the arguments that we hear, especially uh, from people who are seen as diverse, um, so anyone who is different, the, the sort of the, the people who we see in the in the leadership positions right now, is that they feel it's you know it's offensive in a way to them that you know we need a business case that says that justifies why we need to hire black people, why do we need to hire disabled people, why do we need to hire women? So. It's, you know, oh, for, oh, they make money or oh, uh, they will create more growth or innovation. Yeah, now it makes sense. Let's hire them. And I think that's, you know, where um, a lot of people get offended um, for obvious reasons and where there, which is also, you know, one of the risks of business case. And we're looking at everything through profit lens because then we, um, ob it, it, we almost objectify people rather than hire them for their cognitive diversity, we say, you know, they are, you know, again, you know, from tokenization point of view, they look a certain way that directly correlates or causes rather um, profitability, let's hire them. And so, we, we'd argue that's what, that's what organizations do. Cause, cause the, ex the extension of this down that path is, well, that's what organizations do, right? You're getting paid for a job you you are a commodity labor and you are performing a role and you are being paid for that so we really need to ask ourselves what's the purpose of an organization these social justice arguments do they have a place in a modern organization what they told us in 2020 was it did everybody who had the black square and is now talking about was it people profit planet yeah they are now saying, oh, actually, the purpose of an organization is to serve people, make profit, but also to protect the planet or something. I, I don't want to speak too much about that because I, I don't know how, how much of that is actually true. I accept that as a narrative. I, the organizations I deal with and the organizations I'm engaged with, the organizations you're engaged with, everybody here, 
do organizations behave like that really i i i'm not convinced i think the main thing most organizations if you're not in the public if you're not in the public sector if you're a private sector organization they're there to make money and and they feel that the role of individuals albeit maybe you've got a purpose and maybe you want to help people in general is to make money spot my bias as well right being an accountant And and this is and this is interesting. This is something that I want to. Um, I will come back to. Um, so what are especially what you said around what are organisations here to do, and that organisations are here to to make money. And I'll come back to that. Uh, but from what you both have been just um, talking about right now, around uh, aware like, that these are some of the things that sort of I've, I've picked up, and what resonated with me it was around awareness, around emotional intelligence around growth, you talked about a growth mindset, you talked about asking the right questions about psychological safety, cognitive flexibility, and all of these things are elements that we expect our leaders to have. And this is the space that we expect our leaders to lead from. So I guess, um, you know, one of the things past the business, because business cases, again, you know, let's look at numbers let's look at facts let's put it together let's present it to someone let's you know justify something and what are the benefits but actually to be able to derive value to whatever we put in the paper we need effective leadership and when i say effective leadership i mean leadership that is self-aware emotionally intelligent who can ask those powerful open you know effective questions and we had a whole you know linkedin live i want to say last week uh, or two weeks ago uh, specifically on asking powerful questions um and and what is the value of those and the fact that you know we, we talk a lot about you know emotional intelligence in the in the context of leadership but things like uh, emotional literacy intercultural communications asking you know effective and powerful questions are often things that are missed off of the narrative but actually these things are the absolute foundation of building self-aware effective emotionally intelligent uh, leadership so perhaps you know if we if we talk about the business case and, and uh, if not the business case what is the solution um, i would probably say that investing in your leaders and evolving the leadership of your leaders is one of the first things and i'm, I'm saying that also um, with the back of my mind thinking that also the whole notion of what leadership is needs to be addressed because what leadership was again in the 20th century and in the 50s, 70s, 90s is not necessarily the leadership that we need today. And, and going back to what uh, Dr. Jonathan talked about, you know, if the organization was all about profit and today it's about people, profit, planet, that also indicates that we need a slightly different kind of leadership to, um, to lead those environments. And so, you know, I, no, please. Can I speak to that? I think, I think we actually need a different paradigm for work an activity full stop. So I was talking about this 20th century paradigm. Most of the people who are leading FTSE 100, Fortune 500 companies were born in the 20th century and were following a model that's been established then. We're in the 21st century. We've got crypto as well. So the very nature of work is coming to change. So even even the nature of work and the purpose of organizations is coming to change in a way that's going to disrupt a lot of what we've just said this idea of a business case here's an obvious example wikipedia wikipedia is a non-profit making organization isn't it mm -hmm. right it, it relies on donations but people don't join wikipedia wikipedia doesn't exist to make money People don't work at Wikipedia because they think they're going to get paid, do they? So, but they are doing work. We can all agree. And have any of you used Wikipedia in the past week? Probably not in the past week, but I definitely no, have used it this month. No, I took one this month. It's first of April. <laughs> a lot of people use it a lot every single day, every single day. So this is something that's ubiquitous. So even the nature of organizations themselves are coming to change. And I think that's going to have a bigger view. I, I agree with your point about leadership needs to change. But I think there's a lot of people who don't buy into the emotional intelligence and empathy. They don't believe in those things at all. 
we have to remember in this DI space, there's a lot of talk about that. There's people who don't think that's true. And it's worth remembering that when we're talking about diversity, most of the time I'm speaking to an audience that isn't bought into any of this. So as Chaba said, speak to them in a way that they understand. When you're talking about empathy, emotional intelligence, I just want to get the job done today. How do I get it done? All this stuff you're telling me about, I don't care. That, that's how a lot of people think who I deal with. And so once again, speaking to them in a way that they understand, but also in line with what we're trying to achieve is crucial. And your, your previous point, actually one of the first points you made about the house is on fire. A lot of people don't think that. A lot of people just don't, everything is fine. Yep. Yeah, I'm just hearing lots of noise about diversity and inclusion, but everything was fine yesterday. It's probably going to be fine tomorrow. Now I have to do with this diversity stuff. So it needs to be explained. Yeah. And this is why people love this is, this explains the, the prevalence of this whole business case for diversity, but it's, yeah, it's used and abused. It's misled the most, the, I agree with what we were saying earlier, focusing on inclusion, everyone can perform, everyone can belong, everyone can reach their potential. That makes sense. And it made me laugh, uh, you know, uh, that you picked up on that uh, comment around the house is on fire. And in the context that, you know, uh, you said that a lot of people don't care about it. It's like, you know, being in a burning house, the alarm is going off, but I'm getting up from the bed in the middle of the night to take the batteries out and going back to bed. Right. So we, we, we do um, see a little bit of that narrative as well, because it is paradoxical that on one hand we say we want um, higher profits and we want higher growth and we want to be the leaders in our industry and whatever it might be and we want all of this to be unpinned by inclusivity but we don't want to do the work to get there we're gonna you know just plug some people in who look differently that's the easiest thing we can do but we don't want to change our leadership style our working you know culture the whole notion of work uh, that is a huge change and you know you both already have you know mentioned we are you know culture um, comfort creatures and and uh, this um what we're seeing today is just a a testimonial to that chaba did you want to mention anything just to talk about the the companies because i fully agree with you that the change and transformation are nasty words the coaches and trainers love that but not the clients because all they can hear is i'm not good enough it's going to be painful and you want me to pay for that no thank you so <laughs> let's talk about leveling up because that means that you are awesome already and you can be even better. So if you look at the research, 60 to 80% of all problems in a company happen for three reasons, clash of values, clash of personalities and poor leadership. And all three of them stem from the same source, the lack of understanding of why people think and behave differently. So just like in the German language, the highest level of praise is when nobody criticizes you. So what if the highest level of growth is when you stop wasting your potential? Because 90% of, of a, a business is interaction between people who think and behave differently. And according to the three circle partners in the US, 79% of the potential is lost in a team because they clash. 79. That, that is horrible because companies employ the best of the best, hoping to create synergy. But in reality, they deliver only a fraction of the results they are capable of. They have no idea why, or they don't know how much potential remains untapped. So when we approach this topic, then instead of talking about change and transformation and you know all those fancy words, then let's just remove these threats to psychological safety. You don't have to do anything extra, but maybe you can stop doing something silly that can be misunderstood. So you can achieve more with the same amount of energy. And also this is a positive approach because we are not telling the companies that they are not good enough. We show them that, listen, this is the average, 79% of potential is lost. What is your number? Is it 60? Is it 50? Is it 90? But what we can guarantee that it's there. You have a lot of money and potential left on the table. You have that already. And we can help you unlock it by giving you the blueprint. So achieving more with the same amount of energy, that's not too bad. Because people hate losing things. So if you show them that you have it, but you are bleeding money, then you take it seriously. And that can be a way in. Yeah. Hit them where it hurts, right? In the pocket. But uh, as we are so quickly coming to the end of our session, 
Um, there was, you know, one more thing that I wanted to explore with you, but perhaps I'm going to use it as a sort of final thoughts um, question, because we talked about how we need to rethink organizations, um, the people profit planet, you know, piece. And I'm curious, you know, because again, you know, this, and we've said it several times that this business case is very tied to the profit that perhaps, you know, not necessarily works anymore in the environment where we are in and where we are headed. So how can we rethink the business bottom line as we know it today? As an accountant, I, 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 well, I think you've said the answer, but frankly, I don't know enough about it. I, I think it's such a powerful motivation. So if we're rethinking it, we need other incentives. I think it, I think it depends on the nature of work specifically. I, I think, um, yeah, that's, that's what I say. The, the nature of work needs to consider, so the nature of organizations. So if we've got organizations that create value, but it's not necessarily about profit, I think that there is value there. But are you, are you talking about organizations that currently are profit focused, mm -hmm. how they can reconsider it? Yes. Because I don't think absolutely. I know the answer. Yeah. I don't think I know the answer to that. I don't even think there is a right answer. It's just, I think, um, just something to ponder on a little bit and sort of leave, you know, people with some reflections on. And, and you were already, you know, talked about it, that we need to rethink the whole nature of work. And I think uh, that already in a way would make us reflect on what this bottom line actually look like and mean to us. Thank you. We can recycle maybe an answer that's from Jacob Morgan, who asked 140 top CEOs and 14,000 employees, one question what we should be teaching leaders now to prepare for the future. And he came up with four mindsets and five skills. And eight out of nine skills and mindsets were directly linked to how much you understand yourself and others. So if you want to future-proof your organization and your career, then you do have to invest in this topic. How we package it, you call it DNI, you call it uncommon mindset, growth mindset, it doesn't matter. The underlying concept is exactly the same. And I think that is the most important part, that you can change the packaging because that sells, but the content makes it sustainable. And we know one thing, that according to the DARE research, 85% of the jobs that would exist in 2030 don't even exist yet. But what we know, that people skills are going to be more important than ever before. Mm -hmm. So they can d determine if AI is going to be a tool or we are going to be the tools for AI. Mm. And we have to decide now. Thank you for those thoughts. And it also, you know, makes me reflect on, you know, how we have, moved, speaking of technology, how we have moved, you know, 30 years ago, you know, if you picked up a job description of a, an engineer, you know, the, the top skills would be certain languages. There would be, you know, uh, technical skills that you would need to know. But in, you know, in this century, you know, whether you pick up a, digital job description or AI job description, the first five skills will be people skills. And, uh, and you know, we sometimes get lost in, in all of the terms that we have, you know, be it technical terms or be it, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion terms. And we actually lose in, in this jungle of, of terms and notions, we actually lose what we're actually focusing on and what we're trying to deliver. And, and again, go, going back to what both of you have already said, um, it's, focusing on what your organization, what this means in your organization, what is you, your organization looking to get out of this and making it very, very actionable. Um, and you can call it whatever you want, the Jedi, DI, Dib, and, you know, all of the other things. Ultimately, the, you know, the, the goal should stay the same. And then you shouldn't get overwhelmed by all of the terms that are out there right now. So thank you both. Any uh, final thoughts as we wrap up today's conversation? I can't believe it. we've been talking for almost an hour. <laughs> mm. Any final I suppose, thoughts? Hmm? I suppose the, the business case for diversity has not been established in the way that you've been led to believe, and you should find your own business case for diversity. Find out what it means to you, specifically in your team, your organization, and you will make more progress than everybody else. 
Thank you. And Anna earlier asked a question around that as well. And I think you just now very eloquently answered her question as well. Chihaba. I would suggest one thing that, you know, when we talk to clients, then often they want to inspire millions of people and, you know, they have the, all the big buzzwords. But if you cannot get along with your own family, with the people around you and with yourself, that's not going to be sustainable. So let's start small. Let's tidy up around us and then we can grow. We still have a lot to do around us. Let's tidy our household first and foremost. I think those are the golden golden words. So thank you so much both. Thank you, Chaba. Thank you, Dr. Jonathan, for being here, for spending this hour uh, with me. Thank you everyone who joined us here today for your thoughts, reflections, questions, for being engaged with us in this conversation, as I do appreciate it. Uh, a fairly loaded one, uh, but I think we managed to sort of unpick um, some parts of it and I really enjoyed the conversation. And also to anyone who might be watching us on replay and a couple of people asked whether this will be recorded, this is being recorded and you will find um, the recording on my profile and also uh, on Chubb and Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan's profile. So you can always come and revisit this. So thank you so much all for being here. I really appreciate uh, your all engagement and spending your precious time and energy with us. And I look forward to the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.